life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. 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 I am Marshall. I'm Lainey. And I'm Corey. And today we're talking about Season 1, Episode 6 of The Walking Dead, TS-19. This is, of course, a reference to the test subject, 19, that we will discuss a little more later on in the episode. This is the season finale of the first season of The Walking Dead. It was originally broadcast on December 5th, 2010, in the U.S. on AMC. Upon initial airing, the episode amassed 5.97 million viewers, indicating that 4.1% of households that watched television viewed the episode. And then there were a couple encore presentations, which accumulated the viewership to 8.1 million. Wow. At the time of its airing, TS19 was the highest rated cable television series of all time demographically. So this is a really big episode, especially for an episode that I feel wasn't really necessary. I'm just going to yeah, put that right up front there. I, I kind of agree with you on that one. It, it, the entire thing was kind of leading up to this, and then... Yeah, we'll get there. I don't know that I agree, but we'll press on. So the principal photography for TS-19 took place at the Cobb Energy Performing Arts Center, which we did talk about in our last episode. So if you missed that, make sure you go back and listen to episode 6. The other fun thing about this episode is that the opening and concluding scenes of TS-19 are reminiscent of the American television series Lost, which I think we see from the first scene with Shane, which we'll talk about, and the last scene where they're trying to flee the Performing Arts Center slash CDC. The way that it is cut, if you've ever seen episodes of Lost, that's how it's cut. It's very like, it's, what is happening? What is going it, on? Yeah, because doesn't it just start on um, Matthew Shepard, whatever his name's character? Correct. Yeah, Matthew like, Shepard's character is running through the forest. Yeah, it starts on him waking up, right? Yeah. First, and then, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I can definitely see what they're saying. That that was kind of a, like an homage that's reminiscent of that for sure. And you, out of all of us, have actually been has seen Lost most recently. Yeah, so. uh, I did start watching it again, kind of in the background when I was doing some other projects. So yes, I, I, I think I only really got to like maybe season two, the middle of season two. So that's as far as I got on this watch, but I have watched it through at least three other times, maybe. Okay, so let's go ahead and start this episode. So we begin... Closing in on room 450 in the hospital. So we're basically doing a time jump back into where Shane is in the hospital, basically looking for Rick. And he's running around and there's people all over the place. And he's he's like stopping them and saying like, hey, what's going on? Um, then he sees some army guys that basically shoot live people in front of the cafeteria, which to me was kind of like... Um, Forgive the pun, overkill. It's overkill, but it's kind of military thinking of just like, well, we have this widespread disease, we're losing control, so why don't we just remove the people that it could infect or could be infected? Don't don't bother checking, just take them out and get rid of them. It seems to me to be really counterproductive to the fact that you're trying to keep people alive and to keep them from getting the virus, so you're going to take the ones that are actually not sick I just, and it, kill them like it's basically saying preserve the military first shoot first ask questions later i guess right exactly yeah. i yeah the clock on the wall says 215 and that is the same as what it said in the first episode when rick wakes up so there that was still the same which was great uh so shane tries to rescue rick from the bed but he is obviously still alive when he tries to rescue him from mm-hmm. the bed. Now, one thing that I noticed here is that he comes in, and this entire time, Shane's been wearing these black shooting gloves. They're the same shooting gloves that he wore during the scene where they did the traffic stop with aggression. When he's going in to pick Rick up, he then goes to the monitor. When he puts his hands to the monitor, he no longer is wearing those gloves. And we never see those gloves anywhere even if we go to the other episodes where he's in the quote-unquote present he's not wearing those gloves weird so the moment that he goes 
from Rick's bedside to the monitor, he loses the gloves forever. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the monitor, let's tell you what Rick's stats are. His heart rate is 80. His blood pressure, there is no number and there is no last blood pressure, which makes sense because if you look on on him on at the hospital bed, he's not wearing a blood pressure cuff, so there's no way for them to measure the blood pressure. His respiration is 29 and a resting adult typically breathes 12 to 16 times a minute. So I don't know if that's just a really high respiration or what is happening there, but his oxygen saturation is 98%. So technically, he's not doing that bad. Yeah, he, he breathing pretty hard there. Yeah, he's, he's breathing hard. Yeah. Oh, he's dreaming of zombies. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but his heart rate is fine. Get on him. <laughs> he's getting his cardio in during his coma. Right, exactly. So he is laying on the bed and he's unconscious, but they don't shoot him in the head like they do everybody else. When the army people you know, walk in and they look at him, they just go, eh, and then... <laughs> leave without shooting him which again i have to question the intelligence of these army people because if they really want to contain what is happening wouldn't they want to shoot him they probably think he's gonna he's dead already basically which make again makes no sense at all because they already know what is happening when they kill people and they become zombified anyway so, I don't get it. No As logic. the joke goes, the oldest oxymoron is military intelligence. Correct. Sorry to those military people who might be watching us right now. But <laughs> They've experienced yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> then an explosion rocks the hospital, shuts off the electricity, and the troops go, Get out of here! We gotta go! We gotta go! So Shane thinks Rick is dead now. <laughs> well, because of the... Electricity? Because yeah. it went off? Yeah, yeah, the electricity uh, went off, so he also lost. Like, I think he is on a respirator. I think maybe. Oh well, he's he's got oxygen, yes, yeah. but I don't know that he's on a respirator. Yeah, he's on an event, which yeah. I know from watching Grey's Anatomy recently. I know what event looks like now <laughs> because of all the COVID episodes. But yeah, but yeah, Shane then does go and he checks for a pulse. I don't think he does it very well because he does say he never found one. Shane then barricades the door with a bed so the walkers can't get to Rick. So at least there's that. But quite honestly, I still call foul on the fact that Shane thinks Rick is dead. Yeah. Because if he thought he was dead, why would he barricade the door? Yeah, it's kind of kind of suspect. That is where we end before the opening credits. But after the opening credits, the group is entering the CDC, which you remember from the episode before... Rick was yelling at the security camera, let us in, please. We've got women, we've got children, blah, blah. And the door opens. So now they're coming in and they're in total military formation when they're coming in, right? Yeah. And what I'm noting is that the only people that are armed in this scenario are the men. And they just kind of circle around the women and children. And then Daryl's kind of covering the door. It's like, at this point, Rick trusts Daryl like a brother now more than it seems like he even still trusts shane mm -hmm. even though they were like just a day ago they were like i'm gonna kill you because you left my brother out there you know they're already like okay i trust you to get the door and it's still just kind of like this ancient mentality of men as warriors and women and children in the protected center again i'm not a fan because i don't think they trust the women enough to be strong especially when, you know, in future episodes, the way they treat Andrea about being able to shoot, I get it. Andrea has her own issues with, like, trauma and what is happening there. But the way they don't trust Lori to be strong enough to stand up for people, and then Carol will get there, as we know. But Jackie has already proven herself to be a strong oh, yeah. woman when it comes to defending I really am like, what is up with these guys? Like, I know these guys feel the need to want to protect the women and the kids, but I also think that they are causing the women a disservice in not letting them learn to be strong themselves. I would put a shotgun in Jackie's hands. Oh, for sure. Like, I agree with what you're saying. I think the only woman that I would be hesitant to give a weapon to would be Carol, just because of her state of mind at this point, where she's been, she's still got a lot of PTSD. 
mm-hmm. and she might not right. be as reliable at this point, but as soon as she starts showing signs of like stability, then right. for sure. Right, exactly. I like I said, I, I feel like there are, you know, some women there who you want to give a little bit of pause. And, and I think this does happen in season two, where they, they need to be trained, they need to be taught yeah. how, the best ways to defend themselves. And I think that's true in like any case, in any situation. People just need to be taught on how to do this and be given the faith that they can, the support that they can. So anyway, that was that was my little pet peeve about that moment. So then Dr. Jenner appears and asks if anyone is infected. And let's talk a little bit about Dr. Jenner. So the character of Dr. Edward Jenner was modeled after the English physician Edward Jenner, who was a pioneer in the eradication of smallpox, That's which cool. I thought was really interesting considering, you know, what they're trying to eradicate. The other thing that I found interesting about this scene was that you can really tell that this is a performing arts location because there's a really big lobby and then there's these wide ramps that kind of lead up to the second floor. Very reminiscent of pretty much every performing arts theater I've ever been in, where if you have balcony seats, you have to go up these big ramps to the second floor. Yeah, this looks like a performing arts center, for sure. In fact, to the left, well, as you're watching them come in on their left-hand side, there is like an information desk for the CDC that I'm pretty sure was like will call yeah. or like yeah. refreshments or something at some point. That's what it looked like. But the CDC does have, they actually have an entire building for information and as a visitor center. Right, yeah. That is in the CDC complex in the real one in Atlanta. Mm, right, right. But it does make sense that they couldn't film in the real Oh, most right, definitely. Sure. I wouldn't let them in there. So everyone gets into the elevator and they have this whole conversation about who is who and what is happening. And then Jenner says he's going to have to keep his eye on Carl. Wink, wink. Don't we all? Yeah. We all need to keep our eye on Carl. You never know where that kid's going to run off to next. (laughs) And then everyone goes into the main room. Jackie is immediately claustrophobic, which I think that was really cool to like, because I like it when characters have like this one flaw that they have to work through. And that was hers is that she's claustrophobic. But I also find it highly ironic yeah. of what happens to her later yep. that she is claustrophobic. This is zone five. So when we talked about in the last episode, the video that Jenner makes and it says zone five. So zone five is the zone of this part of the CDC. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. When I first saw it, I thought, wow, that clock back there says a very strange time because if you, put that in the military time it looks like it says that it's 4 21 in the afternoon now remember they when they first went into the cdc it was getting dark mm-hmm. so it had to be somewhere between 6 and 8 p.m which is why i found it so weird that it said that not mm-hmm. like that that would be a really weird continuity error but we later find out that that's not a normal clock and the last thing is that the computer system is named vi which is funny because it's also my husband's mother's name Yep. I'm willing to bet that it means verbal interface. Well, that would be the smart thing to think. Because you just talk to it, it talks back. It's basically like Alexa. Next, they go into a lecture hall and they have blood tests. Given what we do learn about the zombie infection, it does seem really weird that he's asking for these. But there's a lot of little bits that are going on here to kind of prepare. First off... While he's taking these blood tests of everybody, they're in this lecture hall room, and there is a whiteboard that's visible. I spent a good 20 minutes backing and forthing trying to read all of this text that is intentionally blurred out by the camera's lens. Like, the way they focus things, you could barely read it. But what I could find was the words progress and diagnosis, and there were some down arrows that were to be seen. There's a hierarchy chart, and there's a thought cloud diagram. And the diagram shows a number of separate subjects that are all linked to smaller groups of three. So what I'm picking up from what they're doing is that in this room, a whole bunch of scientists were gathering together and they were seeing all the different symptoms that these infected the zombies were exhibiting. What was the causes of death and then reanimation to try and figure out the mechanics of the zombie infection so that potentially they could find a way to fight it and reverse it. But I don't think it really worked too well. Also, we see in a later episode that even minor diseases, if left unchecked, can cause a huge issue for a small enclosed society. So I don't think that when Jenner is talking, well, yeah, he's asking about the infected, but when he's doing this test, he isn't testing for a quote-unquote zombie virus. 
he's testing for other pathogens that could quickly spread and kill all of them since they're all in this underground space together. They're all confined. They're all sharing the same air. So one of them being infected with anything could take them all out. Pretty darn quick. Next up, it's time for a food and wine party. And I think this might be my favorite scene scene or, or group of scenes in the episode because it gives them all the opportunity to finally take a breath and relax, even if just for a few moments, knowing that they're going they don't have to be like afraid something is going to kill them at any point. It's like a safe space. Correct. Yeah. So Carl gets some wine and immediately hates it. And as far as I know, I don't ever remember him drink alcohol again for the rest of the series. Just pudding. Yeah, all I see is pudding and right. regular food. Right, we're going to have to track this, I think, too. If we see him drinking alcohol again, we can yeah. see if he does. Daryl makes a stereotypical Asian plus alcohol equals red face tolerance joke. Wow. Shame on you, Daryl. When it looks like they're in this sort of like cafeteria snack bar thing, there's a beverage fridge mm -hmm. over on the side and it looks fully stocked, including wine bottles, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, right? What yeah. he probably did was take everything from all the different other areas they've closed down and put it in this one central snack bar cafeteria location. It has an ice cooler. There are some other things that are cafeteria like there. Yeah, there is actually a full cafeteria style bar mm -hmm. and it does have a menu listed. So there is a regular menu. This day you get these kinds of foods. This day you get these kinds of foods. Then Shane gets a little snarky about the fact that they only found one man when they wanted answers to what was going on and not and a whole team at the CDC. And it's a little jab at Rick. Shane is the most passive aggressive person on this show, really. I think everyone else is pretty much in your face aggressive when they're trying to like put someone down. But Shane has these layers on layers of double meaning pointedly being like harsh with someone that I think is in this season in total. But he's also just very backstabby as well, because in one hand he'll be like, yeah, we need to go with Rick and he knows what he's talking about. And the next minute he's like, good job, Rick. Yeah. I think this is still kind of setting him up to be the villain for next season because uh -huh. this is showing what kind of a villain he is. He's the, I'll support you in front of everybody and then backstab you when it's good for me. And I'm just going to constantly try and build up my own support base right. behind your back. So then Jenner says that people left when things start to get overrun and there were also suicides. That's why he's the only one there. And then Glenn says that Shane is a buzzkill. And he is. He, he is. <laughs> and again, way to go, Glenn. So then the group goes to where they will be sleeping for the night. There seems to be break rooms, rec rooms, showers, and areas to sleep. And there is other areas for long-term residents. But apparently, since he's the only one here, he powered all of them down to save energy on the generators. But that means that nobody gets real beds. Sad face. Then there's a shower montage. We have Lori, who is happy to be in the shower. T-Dog, also happy to be in the shower. And Glenn. All happy to be in the shower. Then Rick gets in the shower with Lori. Shane is shame drinking in the shower and Andrea is traumatized. If you notice, there is something on her knee. We're going to get there later on. But one thing that I really was interested in was that Shane has this tattoo of Little Bird on him. Yeah, it might be his. Like, mm -hmm. they just didn't change it. Yeah, Who knows? Yeah. So then Dale hears Andrea vomiting and Dale comes in to see what's wrong. If you pause the video when Andrea goes from the toilet to sitting against the wall, you can see this little bit of like something poking out from under her right knee. Now, at first I thought it was a knee brace or something. It could also be if you look at the shower sequence, it's a band-aid. But when you look at it here, it's almost like an ace bandage but it's one of those that you like slide up in over into your leg and it's kind of peeking out from her capri pants in season two episode one you will kind of see this again and we will point it out again but there it looks like it's almost a knee pad or a very chunky knee brace so my theory is something happened to her knee 
during filming of some kind and they have to cover it up in different ways so that it doesn't hurt her especially in this point where she's on probably hard tile on the toilet on her knees it's probably hurting her so they had to put something on it so that when she gets up it doesn't hurt as much so then rick who is a little bit drunk visits jenner in the big room and rick says to him we would have died out there it was only a matter of time and if you look at jenner's face it's almost like you see this brief second of him thinking well you're just gonna die in here too yeah and like as rick keeps talking there's this thing in the way that he's he's communicating with Rick that's like he's actually trying not to tell him what's actually going on and the fact that they're all going to die the next day. Mm-hmm. He is trying very hard and he says a whole bunch of different things with his mouth before finally saying, it's going to be all right. During the scene, if you look in the background, that, that special clock now says 1242.06, which means... Either that time has gone forward a considerable amount, or we just lost four hours. Well, you know, four hours for eating and showering, so... Yes. Yes. (laughs) Now we are in the rec room where Lori finds the kids and Carol in a room with books, a TV, and some games. And it seems like everyone has their own bottle or glass of wine right now, except Carol. Which I found interesting, number one, that everyone basically had their own alcohol and they were carrying it around to like their rooms too. But Carol did not probably because of her experience with Ed, because Ed was such a raging alcoholic abuser that she didn't want to go down that road, especially for Sophia, which I thought that was a very good touch to put in this when everyone else was like all about unwinding with the alcohol. Right. So there are some really interesting things in this rec room. I think if I had this rec room, I would be full of joy all the time. (laughs) So let's run down what we can see. Pinball machines, World Porker Tour, Texas Hold'em is one of them. That's a machine used for tournament play. You can see the other. There's a tiki bar area, a jukebox, and a dartboard in the corner, a baby grand piano, a karaoke machine, and a bunch of games and books. So the kids are playing checkers. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a Ms. Pac-Man. With all this stuff in here, there is a Galaga machine back there. They thought we wouldn't notice it, (laughs) but we did. The (laughs) Ms. Pac-Man arcade console, yes. And then Lori tells Carl to go say his prayers while she browses the books. Carol says it might be the first time that they get sleep. So here are the books. Do you know how hard it was to find these? Because you can only see portions of the spines of each one. So I sat there... Looking at pictures of covers of the little bits that I could find. And here are some of the titles. Thursday Next from the First Among Sequels. One is Oblivion by Anthony Horowitz, which is a post-apocalyptic tournament. The House of Christina by Ben Haas, which is a World War II romance about a, a woman who has a whole bunch of different lovers that come in and completely change her life. The Sun Over Breda by Arturo Perez Revente, a war photographer story. Back Home by Michelle Magorian. And this is another World War II story, but this one's about a teen that's being shipped around from different places and trying to find love and loss of... Unfortunately, Hmm. none of them seem interesting to me. No. And I like books. But the one that Lori basically selects is called Reasonable Doubt by Philip Friedman. It is about an ex-prosecutor whose son is murdered. His daughter-in-law is accused and he learns painful truth about his son's life in the whole process of trying to figure out what is going to happen about his son's murder. That's a very uplifting book to unwind with. Right? But she was like, right? If you look at how she picks that book, she doesn't browse for long. She's like, Oh, that one. <laughs> that I mean, was like I'm she wanted to read it before. Lori's addicted to trauma anyway, so it probably feels like home for her. <laughs> I mean, if I was in her position, I would probably have picked Back Home because, you know, that's a nice, that was nice enough to be like a Disney movie. That's that's how, like, gentle the story was. Like, that's what you would pick to relax right, with. Right, yeah. So then Shane comes in at the doorway and he's like mouth breathing over in the corner. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. Why, Shane? why i have to say that this coming scene how i feel about this whole episode aside 
this scene, as much as I really don't like this scene, I felt was necessary to really solidify Shane's villain status mm -hmm. in this show. So he's over there watching her. I did notice that the clock in the bookcase in front of her says 1010. And I'm noticing that right over her head is a board game where men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And next to that is the board game of Survivor. Which is hysterical. I think it's, it's indicative of so many levels of what is happening right now. <laughs> so they go into this whole conversation. Lori says that Shane lied about Rick being alive and he denies it. I also call it liar. Um, maybe in the moment he didn't realize it, but he definitely knew he was alive because of the barricade. He says he did not hear a heartbeat, but as we know, because he was on a monitor and he put his hands on that monitor while the electricity was still on, that there were no flat lines on the monitor at all for heartbeat or respiration. None of that. Blood pressure, again, doesn't count because he's not wearing a blood pressure cuff. But there were no flat lines. There were actual heartbeats on that monitor. So Shane, I call, I call it again, liar. And he was wearing gloves. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't actually wearing gloves for the shot, but we're just going to count it as he was wearing gloves. Uh, all of his gloves, however, were self-interest. Right. Uh, so he keeps backing her into a corner and saying he saved her life and that she needed to admit that he saved her life, et cetera. He's, he's grabbing her face. She's like, no, grabbing her neck. And he's just being such a predator at this point that it is so uncomfortable. He is trying to kiss her and he's forcing himself on her when there are freaking people next door in the next room who could walk in at any second to see what he's doing. So she gets aggravated and scratches his face and neck. So there's these three long gashes down from his cheek all the way down to his neck. And this is kind of like in the comic, there's this kind of fight between Rick and Shane. And then Carl shoots at Shane mm -hmm. and leaves a scratch on him. Right, on his neck. Mm -hmm. There was also this whole decision that Robert Kirkman was talking about at one point that the reason why they showed the scene at the beginning of the episode was to prove that Shane had redeeming qualities, that he wanted to help Rick, that he really genuinely made effort to get him at some point. But I think not only did that not come across in the way they wanted it to, but this scene totally negates and also confirms that Shane is a misogynistic jerk and he should be me too'd and exiled immediately. He is voted off the island. Bye-bye. Rick enters his sleeping area. Carl is on the couch and Lori and Rick are on the floor. Now, Rick says, you don't have to be afraid anymore. We're safe here. I would like to really dive into what he's saying here because he obviously has no idea what just went down. Right. So as a woman, if I had been attacked like that, I'm not sure how I would feel about another man's hands on me, even if it's my husband's. And although Rick had no way of knowing that, I think that even if another man, so soon after being attacked, put his hands on me, even in a reassuring way, I would probably freak out. That makes sense. And I don't know why she doesn't, except that she's trying to hide it. Because she's stronger than they give her credit for it. That's why. Yeah. And she, I, I think she is hiding it for a very good reason. She can't really tell what Shane did without admitting what she's been doing. And she's guilty, even though I don't feel like she really has to be. No, I don't think so either. No. Because I, I think if she tells Rick, this is what happened, because I thought you were dead... I honestly believe that Rick would turn around and be like, I totally understand. And he would take it out on Shane and not Lori. And I'm not even sure if he'd take it out on Shane. He'd probably turn around to Shane and be like, look, I know what happened. I get your feelings right now. This is how I'm feeling. We might have some awkwardness, but we got to work together. From, from Rick then, sure. But I think that because if Rick said that to Shane, Shane would probably not react in that way, he would react like like a, like a predator dragon. again. So I think that, that it wouldn't do, do no good except to have Rick have to almost sever his relationship with Shane at that point. Mm -hmm. But at least he would know what was going on. 
his quote there about we're safe here, he's talking about outside the walls. But Lori's fear is locked inside the walls. And that is just as scary to her. It might not kill her, but it is something to be fearful about because he's pulling the wool, kind of, over other people's eyes. Mainly Rick's. I think the other people kind of are starting to get what kind of person well, Shane Well, yeah, when is. they saw what he did to Carol's husband. That. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So, yay. They get one night of sleep, maybe. We don't know about Lori, but everyone else probably got one night of sleep. They're back to the cafeteria for breakfast, and T-Dog makes eggs. I think that's so nice. Powdered eggs. Um, Carl asks Rick if uh, Carl asks if Rick is hungover, because he said, well, Mom said he was going to be hungover. And he is. Glenn is also clearly hungover, but sweet Jackie comes over and kind of consoles him a little bit about being hungover. There is also bacon and orange juice. So it sounds like a good breakfast to me. Not Not powdered bacon. Yes. No, no no one wants powdered bacon. (laughs) T-Dog notices the scratches on Shane's neck. Kind of surprised that they didn't really dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, because like Shane says, well, I must have done it in my sleep. It's not like me. And everybody in the room is like, that makes no sense. You have no nails like that. But then he looks at Lori with this almost accusatory glance. And I'm like, dude, it's not her fault. You don't blame the walker for attacking you because he wants to eat. And you don't blame the woman for attacking you because you're abusing her. Yeah, she had no accuse. So this is also kind of like previously when Shane tried to shoot Rick and Dale saw it, the way that he talked to Dale is very much like this, where he's telling them what the truth is. And he's giving them this this look. It's the same kind of look that he gave Dale. He's trying to tell her, this is what happened. Don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. Then they are all back in the big room, Zone 5, and Jenner explains what exactly TS-19 is. So they, he shows them this video of the test subject. Brain scan. The really brain, cool. Yeah, the brain scans and how the virus affects someone. And then you see that they are shot in the head. Mm-hmm. So it lists the time of death and the reanimation, but in a weird kind of code. It also lists a rate of... Necrosepsis. I can't read that. (laughs) So the rate of necrosepsis is because what we have seen is that people are dying of something else. Mm -hmm. And when they die, they reanimate. And so this necrosepsis is basically the uh, infection of dead tissue. It's It's like sepsis where you have an infection from just like toxic materials. Then we noticed some other things on the video. It's... Time stamp is 27-16-05-15 and playback 3995. The archive unit is 4517. Test subject 19 was bitten and volunteered to record the process of the infection and the infection spreads like meningitis because it affects the brain. Jenner says that he also lost someone too in this whole thing, which you're starting to connect the dots about who TS-19 might actually be. He also says that reawakening is anywhere from three minutes to eight hours. This one was two hours, one minute, and seven seconds. This is interesting, too, when you think back to Amy. Amy was obviously a long time. She was closer to the eight hours spectrum because she was bitten at night when they were having dinner, which we know was around 6 p.m., and we know she woke up in the morning as a walker. And so it was probably closer to the eight-hour mark. I would really like to see what it it looks like for somebody to be three minutes. (laughs) I think we do see that occasionally. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we will. The neocortex doesn't come back, so the human part of you is dead. It's basically just this insane hunger. It's a brainstem, right? It's only the brainstem that comes back. Correct. I guess it's, it's not explained as well. Because we noticed that zombies do things that could conceivably be human logic. There is something that happens in the first episode that I would really like to argue about when we get there that has to deal with the human part of your brain. Mm -hmm. I don't know that if this explanation is satisfactory to me. It may be that death of the subject 
especially in the cases where it takes so long for them to reanimate that more and more of the brain tissue is deteriorating, which means that more and more of the neocortex is lost, and then they then lose more of their humanity. So the quote-unquote smart walkers may have actually been those that reanimated within three minutes. It's also like he hasn't had a full set of test subjects there. He can't make a definitive statement about all walkers because I don't think he's had the sample size to really... He's had 19 of them. Right. But and we see millions. Yeah. Now, one other thing, and this is my big survival note, it's very important. If you find yourself in a zombie apocalypse, there's one thing that you have to remember. There is no known microbe, virus, or prion, anything that is organic. There is nothing that we have ever experienced that can do what this is doing. The energy required to restart the human body after death is so intense that no quote-unquote disease can possibly have the power to do it. Therefore, if you find yourself in a zombie apocalypse, it will either be with still living people that are reduced to mindless predators, or it's some sort of paranormal event. If this is just standard living people that are running around trying to bite you, this is good news, kind of. I mean, it's sad that they're reduced to that, but it means that you can kill them by killing them the way you would kill a normal person. You can just shoot them in a way that would put a normal person down, and they, they're done. If it's a paranormal event, I have no clues for you, you're done. <laughs> So Jenner says that he has been in the dark, metaphorically, for a month. So he doesn't know really what's happening outside, anywhere. It's just whatever he's doing down in his hole, basically, right? The countdown behind Daryl says one hour and 13 seconds. Yep, that's right. This clock has been in a countdown the entire time. So Dale finally asked about the clock, because Dale honestly is one of the most observant people in this group. That's why he was always on watch. Yes, always. I do have to say that, you know, he's the one who notices that there's something going on between Lori and Shane. He's the one that notices when something funky is going on with Andrea. Way to go, Dale. I love how observant you really are. So then Jenner says that the basement generators run out of fuel and then the facility-wide decontamination occurs when the clock runs down. And now we have another issue. (laughs) Yeah. Just another yes. wrinkle. So the guys go down to the lower basement levels to check what the levels are of the generators, and they are empty. There is one that's almost empty, but for the most part, they're all empty. The emergency lighting comes on and the air conditioning stops. So now all life support is starting to shut off in this area. So Jenner basically is like, yep, the end is coming. So everyone's asking him what's going on. They're literally freaking out. He grabs a bottle of whiskey from Daryl's hands. Daryl, from the point of the fact they had dinner the first night to now, has had a bottle of alcohol in his hand 24-7. And what's really funny is I had to run this part back a few times, but Daryl basically, like, peeks his head out of the hallway of his bedroom, like, what's going on? And Jenner just walks down the hall and, like, with just... A very smooth swipe grabs the alcohol from Daryl's hand and just keeps walking. And Daryl's like, "What? What? 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 What, <laughs> what happened?" <laughs> it was he just, doesn't he doesn't mind it too much. He's just like, "How did that happen?" <laughs> <laughs> so just like blink and you miss it type thing, right? So he reveals to everyone that the French were the last ones to hold out in the wake of this whole pandemic that is happening. And then then someone says, the world runs on fossil fuel. How stupid is that? Yeah. We're still asking that question, aren't we? Well, the CDC has been asking that question for a while now. As of 2016, nine of their buildings were outfitted with solar panels on on their campus. So this won't happen. Mm. This whole thing of we're out of power, not going to happen at the CDC in Atlanta. Good thing. Well, you know, we live in Florida. So us going to the CDC in Atlanta, you know... I guess that makes me feel better because I think the CDC in Atlanta is actually closest to us. I think it only takes like three or four hours to get there from here. As long as you don't have the highways blocked. Correct. The Rick tells everyone to get their stuff so they can leave. And even at this point, Jackie is like, okay, I'll go get my stuff. I just want to point that out right now because Mm -hmm. we'll come back to it. So then the alarm goes off. 
And Jenner scans his ID. He has shut and locked the internal door. We already know the outside door is locked. And he said that was for everyone's protection. But we don't really question that, right? Because we know we don't want anything to get in. Yeah. Zombies or people. But this inner door is a little suspect. He tries to start recording a message. So Daryl gets really mad and like tries to hit him with a whiskey bottle. So he takes the whiskey bottle back and then hits him with it. And then Jenner talks about the HITs, which are high impulse thermobaric fuel air explosives. While he's talking, the song Running to the Rain by Peter Gabriel is on in the background. Uh, There are no lyrics to the song, but I can kind of see why this would be an appropriate song. It's very like science fiction-y. It it sounds like with with definitely the synthesizers. But also, if... Everywhere I was about to be had the air suddenly be turned on fire. I would be running to the rain as well. Correct. So that is exactly what the HITs do is they set the air on fire and basically cleanse everything of the germs. And the thing is, if these temperatures that he's listing are legit, they are overkill. Because not only would it kill everything in the building, it would turn everything of the building to a gas almost spontaneously basically when he's talking about these these temperatures he's doing it in a very fancy way of saying it gonna explode (laughs) the boiling point of iron alone is 5182 degrees fahrenheit and he said that it goes starting at 6000 degrees whoa well We do see the after effects of that later, so I'm not surprised. Everyone else is really upset and shocked by this, almost to the point where they, like, almost start to shut down. Except for Dale, who just looks at the guy like, you are crazy, crazy kittens. (laughs) Just, wow. Then Shane and Daryl try to break the door down with axes, which we know axes is a very big thing in this series, right? People Mm -hmm. are always... Doing stuff with axes. I I don't know. And then Daryl tries to hit Jenner with his axe because he just, he just, no, he wants to fight. Yeah. And if we are looking at these as the fire axe is also representing authority, this could be a symbolic way of saying that the only way to get through what's going on is to get away from Jenner's despair and suicidal tendency. Right. So he doesn't really care at this point that Mm -hmm. everyone's going to go up and fire because he was going to commit suicide before they showed up. So to him, it's just kind of like, whatever, it's going to happen, we're all going to die. So Jenner says that Rick said to him that he knew it was just a matter of time until everyone he loved was dead, which of course, everyone is kind of like, wait, what? Why'd you give up on us, right? Jenner says there will be no pain. And Carol says her daughter doesn't deserve to die like this. I find this very ironic considering what happens to Sophia in season two. Yeah. So here's a question. Would you rather your daughter, I mean, if your daughter had to die, I'm not saying your daughter has to die, but if your daughter had to die, would you rather she get incinerated by fire or turned into a zombie and then killed? Less pain, better. So fire. As long as the fire is as quick as he's saying. If she's instantly evaporated like this, sure, she won't feel a thing. But if it's more like the fire that we see in the previous episode, decontaminating that lab? Heck no. Burning alive is painful. And that was not enough to vaporize everything in that lab. No. So then Shane decides he's going to threaten Jenner with a gun, which is kind of a stupid move, in my opinion, because uh, Jenner knows he's going to die anyway. What does he care? It hurts more if he gets shot with a gun. Hello? No brain chain. I I wanted to say that Rick must feel a certain amount of guilt for bringing them there in the first place. Because it was his idea to go... Well, actually, it was Morgan's idea to go to the CDC, and Rick took it, and they did it, and this is what they find. They find no answers, for the most part, and death by fire. That's got to be some kind of guilt for him, right? Mm -hmm. And at that point, Jenner says he made a promise to stay to Test Subject 19, who turns out to be his wife. Yeah, and I thought as he was describing his wife, he said that she was the smart one. She was the smartest one that worked there, which I thought was just the cruelness of fate and Kirkman to make the smartest CDC scientist be the one to go to get killed and take it out when they would need her the most. At the same time, this is 
another one of those points where we see somebody who seems to be very important, but was actually somebody who was not as important. Jenner says, I was not very important here. I didn't really do anything important. Mm -hmm. She was the important one, but now he seemed to be super important because he's the only one we see. That is true. Daryl is back to trying to axe the door again. Wouldn't you? (laughs) Then, finally, Jenner says, okay, I'll open the door. So earlier, he had been talking about how all these doors couldn't be opened anymore. The, that there's no escape now from this room because of the protocols. And he could have opened it the entire time. He was willingly holding all these people here. Not only that, that door used power to go from below to up and now had to require power to hold itself in that. He was wasting time and power to hold these people in there with him while he died. That is hyper selfish. Yes. Oh, and there's Agreed. four minutes left on the clock, by the way. Four and a half. Rick thanks Dr. Edwin Jenner for letting them leave. And then Jenner says, the day will come when you won't be. And this is actually the title of the season seven, episode one uh, premiere episode. And uh, I guess, you know, we'll talk about what happens in that episode <laughs> when we get there. Then Jenner whispers something in Rick's ear, which if you can tell from the look on Rick's face is very shocking and very surprising. But we won't find out what that is until the end of season two, what he says. At this point, I want to say that I feel like while we talk about what why this episode was even included, in my opinion, there are two things that happen in this episode that are important. The first one being the way that Shane attacks Laurie. And the second one being this one little bit of information. And other than that, I don't believe that this episode, while very action-packed and very exciting, I just don't feel that this episode was needed. In fact, it wasn't even in the comics. They don't go to the CDC in the comics. So if they can do it in the comics, I don't think they really need to show it here, especially when everything else feels like they just... Keep talking full circle for circle. So let's stop a minute before we end this episode. There are still some things that happen, but let's stop a minute and discuss what you think about that. I just felt like you could have handled all of this outside of the CDC. The villainization of Shane could happen literally anywhere, no matter where they went. The way that he acted towards Lori could have happened anywhere. What Rick learns from Jenner, it turns out to not actually be impactful for the rest of the story. It's impactful for Rick's mindset, but it's not actually impactful for the plot. Yeah, the only thing I think that was interesting about this episode in the way is to show, to give them a break and let them just be able to relax mm. and thing. Now, that could have happened other places, I'm assuming, but that was the only thing I think that, you know, was a benefit to this episode. I don't really have an opinion either way whether they needed to go to the CDC or not. So there are four minutes left. And at this point, Jackie decides to stay because she doesn't want to end up like Jim or Amy. And in my opinion, this is completely out of character for her. I just was like, wait, why? Like, what are you, what is your reasoning? Yeah, you don't want to end up like Jim or Amy, but did you did you just suddenly lose all interest in living in like a couple minutes because this guy was being a jerk? The only other thing that I can think of too that may have swayed her is the fact that he his basic revealing of keeping them in there with him may have made her realize that he didn't want to die alone. And the type of person that she is would probably go he needs someone with him when he dies. So I should do that since I still don't want to go on. But I still don't get it. I do not get it. She is a fighter, has been the entire series. She's caring. She was doing that, you know, she was caring for Jim. But all of a sudden, she just, I don't know, she gave up. And I really, I i still, I've said it like all season. I do not understand this decision. If anybody could just stay behind with him, like if that was all that she was doing here, she could have just turned to Dale and been like, yeah, well, he needs somebody with him, so... Andrea wants to let her. Yeah, she's got crappy reasons, but the Jackie's reasons were worse. And as we saw earlier, that she was 
claustrophobic. So why is she all of a sudden? I'm not gonna exactly. Stay. Yeah. Exactly. I think this was just okay. We want to get her out of here. We don't. We don't want her character here anymore. Right. I think it was bold. So Andrea says all of a sudden she's gonna stay. She's she's now she's done. And Dale's like, nope. And so he goes in there and basically just says, if you stay, I stay. And she goes, you have no right to make this decision for me. And he goes, you have no right to make this decision for me. <laughs> Dale. <laughs> I, it, I don't know. I don't know why that makes me giggle. But I, I think maybe because sometimes I feel like Andrea is just, despite her trauma, does not think straight. <laughs> at all and including the fact how she responds to dale after this goes down and she blames him for not letting her commit suicide but also for making her save him <laughs> i was like wow <laughs> that happens in i think episode one and we'll talk about that then but wow yeah it's funny because she's like acting childish and he's acting childish in front of her to show her how childish she's acting basically he's mirroring her behavior exactly so then they try to get outside the doors and rick and daryl are trying to hit the windows again trying to get it open and so he's desperately trying to break out carol hands him a grenade which was the same grenade that Rick found in the tank in the series premiere days gone by. And she said she found it when she washed his uniform. But what really got me was Shane's comment. Because she's like, hey, I've got something here that might help. And he goes, oh, we don't need a nail file. Really? Like, you've seen a woman who went from getting beat on the regular, who is continuing to survive... And then you saw her whack that dead husband's head way open with the axe. And now she's she's saying she has something that's useful and you're going to discard that? You're just going to be like, oh, well, it's not about beauty. It's about getting out of a wall. Not only is that funny, because what Carol was doing was a completely selfless act. She was washing Rick's clothes rick who she didn't even know at that point knew lori she knew lori so maybe she was doing it for lori but she doesn't have to wash the clothes of anybody besides her her daughter and her husband and a lot of times her husband would be angry if he found out that she was but she really wants to do her part in the camp she said that to rick but this completely selfless act may be the one thing that saves them mm -hmm. and i just gotta say that was a really nice point that they wrote into this with this grenade. I thought just just so smart how they not only made this a character choice, but also a plot choice as well. So they finally get the windows broken. Yay. And they can get out. We already kind of talked about the whole Dale and Andrea thing. Did anyone see that Daryl not only killed a walker with a melee hit from his crossbow while they're running out? But when he does this, he launches the head of that walker like two yards away from himself. <laughs> he doesn't just go, whack, it's dead. It's whack, and you're out of the park. That was like excellent melee strike. You haven't seen this since you've been playing Halo. Come on, that kind of a melee hit. <laughs> so Dale, I guess, finally gets Andrea to get out. So with 22 seconds left, you see them crawling out of the window. And the CDC explodes. So this is how they did it, I found out. A plate was installed on set which hovered over the pyrotechnics. So this plate was turned upside down to create an optical effect where the tr flame travels across the panel. This created an illusion that the explosion was expanding. The sequence is divided into six different cuts. The first one consisted of the rupture of the glass of the building. The last frame concluded with the collapse of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That's kind of cool. I like knowing these little tidbits about how they do things like that. So it's basically just a mirror that they tilted to make it look like the flames were getting bigger. Correct. Yeah. So the survivors are leaving the CDC, and the song that is playing is Tomorrow is a Long Time by Bob Dylan. And I'm going to share with you some of the lyrics from this song. Some people were saying that one of the reasons why this song is applicable is because they had to wait so long for a second season. They had to wait 11 months 
from this point to when the second season started. Which would have actually started in in universe the next day. Yes. So here are some lyrics from the song. If today was not a crooked highway, if tonight was not a crooked trail, if tomorrow wasn't such a long time, then lonesome would mean nothing to you at all. Yes, and only if my own true love was waiting, and if I could hear her heart a softly pounding, yes, only if she was lying by me, then I'd lie in my bed once again. I wonder how much it costs. Because <laughs> it's Bob Dylan. <laughs> yeah. When we are looking at the five cars in the caravan, there were five that approached the CDC and five are leaving. I'm making it a point to say this because something's happened in episode one where there are not five cars in the caravan anymore. So the five cars are still the RV, the SUV. It's not really an SUV, but that I don't really know what else to call it. Um, it's Carol's SUV. There's a van, a truck, and a Jeep. Also in the truck is Daryl's motorcycle. The last thing we want to say about you know, this particular episode chronologically is that in a 2014 interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Robert Kirkman revealed that he regrets revealing that everyone in the New World is infected too soon, saying, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't have done the CDC episode at the end of season one. It possibly gave away too much information and was such a big change very early on in the series. So, uh, yeah, I, I think... What he's saying is that maybe if they had done this later, it would have been a good idea. Um, I kind of understand what he's saying, and I kind of semi-agree with him. They could have revealed it without even the CDC thing. Just the actual inaction, it can be revealed. Yes, correct. Even if they wanted to have somebody sit there and actually explain these mechanics outright, they could have done that. They could have had somebody like Jenner wander around with them for a little while and be like, this is what I know. And then have him get bit and be done with them. Mm -hmm. So first let's talk about, so who died in this episode? Jackie and Jenner were the two that died in this episode. And, you know, they didn't really die by anyone's hand, really. Uh, that Except maybe their own, because they could have left. Yeah, they could have just walked out. Mm -hmm. The comic book connection. When I was reading, there weren't a lot of connections with what happens at the CDC as a whole. The fact that they went to the CDC is not in the comics. However, there are some events that are similar to uh, what happens, you know, with Shane being scratched, Dale comforting Andrea. Dale really likes to comfort Andrea, if you get what I'm saying later on Even more in, in the, the comics. Comic, yeah. Yes, which is really weird. But <laughs> anyway, let's talk about... This season as a whole, since we are at the end of season one. This episode is not my favorite. And there were a couple episodes where there was a lot of talking and it seems like not much is happening. Primarily episode five and six. So I agree with Kirkman that this episode was probably not needed, except for what happens with Lori and Shane, like we talked about. On the whole, my favorite episode was episode two which was Guts, because it really showed like the group was starting to come together. They figured out the whole thing about having Guts on them. And I think it just really showed this establishment of this group and these characters. I would have to agree with that one. I did enjoy that they figured that out. It does seem a little early for them to figure out that trick, but still it was cool to have them find that teamwork that early. I would say my favorite episode was episode four, Vatos. Just because it was a nice blend between action, drama, and comedy in this world. I do enjoy it when you can have a little bit of comedy and levity in these post-apocalyptic worlds. You can see these strong characters and how they're surviving and the morality of their survival. Those are some of the things that I found most interesting about this show is different people's morality of surviving rather than just, well, there's a zombie, let's shoot it. And that is our season one, episode six of The Walking Dead. Next week, we are going to talk about season two, episode one, What Lies Ahead, which is a whole new season for us. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. 
If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek. Yeah.